God, what would you have us do? Who are you calling us to be? We follow Jesus here. We fulfill God's mission here. Hello, and thanks so much for joining our online gathering here at Shoreline Community Church. We are a community about becoming and making disciples of Jesus as we gather, grow, and go together. We'd love to hear from you, and you can do that by filling out a Connect card. This will help us get in contact with you so you can share prayer needs and praises, ask for more info on things like groups and baptisms, and so much more. If you are new around here, you can fill out our Connect card and bring it to us in the lobby where we would love to meet you and give you a special guest gift. Now, here are a couple things coming up at SCC. First, we have annual celebration next Sunday on February 26th at 6 p.m. We hope you can join us as we look back at an amazing year that we had here at SCC and all we were able to do, and as we look forward to what the Lord has for us this coming year. Also, we have a seniors lunch coming up, so if you are 65 and up, be sure to join us Thursday, March 2nd from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you've been to the previous ones, you know what a great time it is with good food, fun, and friends. So we hope to see you there. So before we hear the next message in our Finding Hope series, check out this video about an exciting initiative that SCC is partnering with called One Day to Feed the World. The greatest gifts in life are the ones we don't even realize we've been given. The resources to provide. The confidence certeza. in supply. The belief for enough. The power of a meal is often underestimated, but should never be overlooked. For decades, Convoy of Hope has been giving hope through agriculture initiatives, disaster relief, women's empowerment, children's feeding programs, and more. And One Day to Feed the World helps make this possible. The security that comes with a guaranteed meal can ignite the belief in and practical path to a better life. Please partner with us as we continue bringing other children and families to the table. Hey, welcome back. Today we're wrapping up our series on hope, and I, I hope you've been enjoying it. I know it's, it's been a great study for me. And today, as we wrap up our series, um, I want to start with a question. You know, have you ever walked into a room and just felt at odds? Things just felt off? It seemed like there was arguing going on, or maybe you, you just didn't feel like you were a part of it. Now, contrast that with you walk into this room. And there seems to be this sense of peace, but yet there's this energy going on. There's this sense of everyone is together where things are happening. You're like, boy, I've, I've always wanted to be a part of this group, and they want me to be a part of it. Jesus shared this hope with his disciples as he, in his part of his farewell prayer, that he prayed over them. And the hope that he had for his disciples, one of the big hope was a key word that we often use in the body of Christ and when we gather together and who are in Jesus. And that key word is the word unity. Unity was one of the big hopes that Jesus had for his disciples. And this is part of his prayer. And we see this in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 21 to 23. Let's, let's read this together today. John 17, 21 starts off by saying, I pray, this is Jesus, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Such a wonderful, and again, this is just a section of Jesus' prayer that's often referred to as his farewell prayer. And in this, he's talking about this word unity. It's so important. So as we dive into this today, uh, this prayer that Jesus prayed for unity, this is the prayer that I pray for all of us, Shoreline Community Church, is that we would be unified. We would dwell together in unity. So let's begin today. But first of all, let's, let's find a good working definition. What is unity? When we talk about unity, what are we talking about? Well, when the Bible talks about unity and in this prayer that Jesus just prayed, the word that Jesus uses for, for unity to describe it is the word one. Jesus prayed. He said, I pray that you are one. You know, this is the same language and the same word that is used in so many other areas. And as it relates to unity, uh, one is the word that God uses to describe marriage. 
In Genesis 2.24, it's recorded, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. See, one is the word that God uses to describe this, this sense of being unified, and it's the word that he uses to describe his relationship with God. Jesus says it here in his farewell prayer. He says, the Father and I are one. We're in unity together. See, when Jesus uses the word one, here's what he means. By being unified, he means that we are complete, lacking nothing. See, what Jesus is talking about is the need that we have for each other. If I'm walking by myself, if I'm isolated, I'm not walking in unity. See, the, the, the life of faith, Christianity, is not a solo sport. Being a Christian is not about being ourself and just having good morals and just trying really hard to live this good life by ourselves. That has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity is not a solo sport. It is a community event, and it's about being supported. As a matter of fact, there's no biblical evidence to support, uh, to support this notion that following Christ is about being, your, being alone by yourself, that you can be a Christian without this connection. Being a follower of Christ is walking in the ways of Christ, his life alive in you, which means we are all connected. We're in community one with another. That's why when Jesus... Uh, spoke about following him, about being a Christian, it was always in this context of community. And when, when the, even when the Bible talks about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it uses this word one to mean that they are distinct, but yet one. See, every believer is distinct. We all, we've been given our gifts, we've been given different abilities, we're all different parts of the body. And I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 139, the psalmist says that we are all uniquely and wonderfully made, but yet, we are all one in Christ. See, being one, it doesn't mean that we are all made like a cookie cutter. We're not just a bunch of clones getting off the Star Wars ship coming out somewhere. We are one in that we are distinct, but we're also one meaning that we're together. See, being one, it means that we are one with Christ. We've surrendered and we've, we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But being one also means that we are one with his body, the church. That's all of us who we've given our life to Christ. We are one in, in the body of Christ. But it also means that we are one in purpose, meaning that we are actively living out the love of Christ together and a part of his plan to reconcile the world back to him. This is what one means. One means that we've been totally, we are totally submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ. See, Unfortunately, some have confused being one with dating. See, dating is not becoming one. Dating is a very minimal commitment. It's, you know, it's, it, in dating, it's like, well, I like it. It's fun right now. There's some excitement to it. Um, but there's no lifetime commitment in dating. There's, there's no real surrender. There's none of that mutual uh, submission to each other. That's why when the Bible talks about unity, when it talks about that level of commitment, it uses the illustration of marriage. Marriage is that picture of becoming one where, you know, in, the, in those vows, this is the, these are the vows that Stephanie and I made to each other where we said for better, for worse, uh, for sickness and in health, forsaking all others, meaning I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be led away by anything else. And it was actually, it was contractual. It was a covenant relationship before, uh, before God, but it was also a contract. We signed a marriage license. And in this, we were becoming one, meaning that, this, that we've made this lifetime commitment and we've experienced all those things. We've experienced sickness, we've experienced health, uh, we've experienced for better and for worse, all of those things. And in it, it's made us stronger through this commitment because we were unified in our commitment to God and our commitment to, uh, to each other. See, some people think that they are one with, with Christ when really, Instead of being one with Christ, they're just dating Christ. Where, and it's, it's, it's not even really dating. It's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of times it's like, well, I'll choose Christ when there's no one else available, when there's nothing else to do, or when I'm lonely, when I have that need in my life. But this isn't the way that we'd want to be treated, and it's not the way that we treat Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And unfortunately, some who have been fooled by this, Jesus calls us out of Matthew 7 when he says that not everyone who calls to me on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and, and we perform many miracles in your name. 
But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And, and, when, and other versions uh, describes these people as evil doers. What Jesus is saying is that we were never one. We were never unified. It is so important that we walk in unity with Christ. And so my prayer is that no one falls into this group, that no one is is self-deceived in in thinking that they're married, that that they've connected, they're in unity with Christ, and they show up in that day. So what does unity look like? How do we know when we're walking in unity with each each other? Well, one, uh, peace. Unity brings peace to our life. You know, when we are walking in unity, the Bible describes this, this covering of peace that covers us. I mean, so many times we're, we're so stirred up because we're divided and we're uncertain. You know, there's often this, this anxiousness that covers a lack of unity. You know, when things are, and when things are not together, we should be anxious. When things are wrong, we should be anxious. When the doors open on your car, there should be bells going off so that we don't fall out, so that we don't get hurt. It's, a, it's like when, the, when your phone, there, there's a battery low light that comes on because we don't want to lose access to our phone and to communication or what it is, whatever it is that we hope to do. We have smoke detectors in our house to let us know when things are off. See, a lack of unity will always make us vulnerable. So it's important that we take care of things before they shut down or before they're even destroyed. You know, Jesus, he illustrated this in his parable about the house that was built upon the rock, meaning that we're one with God versus the one that was built on the sand where the house looks good, but there's nothing solid holding it up, holding it together. See, peace is this accompaniment to uh, unity that we have with God, one with God and one with the body of Christ. Where it said in Proverbs 16, it says that, that when our ways please the Lord, he even makes our enemies to be at peace with us, to be at peace with us. See, peace doesn't mean we never experience difficulty. Peace doesn't mean that we never experience uh, these challenges or storms, that the waves are going to blow, the rains are going to come, those things are going to happen. But in the middle of it, we have peace in our life because we're at one with God and at one with the body of Christ. You know, one of the other evidences as it relates to unity is trust. Unity brings trust. I know in my lifetime, uh, it seems like we are more divided than ever, whether, whether it's in the areas of the government or in academics or healthcare, the family or even the church. All of these areas are struggling. And it's often been said that the generation that is coming up right now is one of the least trusting generations um, ever, and with good reason. Our generation is witnessing to her that, that they'll see multiple experts of a panel on a stage talking about one topic coming to very different conclusions, and they all say that they've, they've had the same logic, the same background. I mean, how confusing can it be for the generation that is here, let alone for, for all of us? Every research institution that I've looked at is in agreement on this, that trust is at an all-time all low. But when you step into a place where there's unity, where there's that unity of purpose, there's that unity of love and this unity of action, there's this inherent trust that accompanies it. See, unity brings credibility. There's this crowd of witnesses that testify to the truth, that testifies to the validity of God. It's often been said that even for this generation coming up that it's very hard for them to trust the news that they see. But who do they turn to to try to find the answers? They turn to their friends, to people that they know, people that walk with them, people that are experiencing things and walking out. See, the world can be a crazy place, but when I walk into a place that is unified in Christ, unified in the purpose, unified in the love of God, and unified in the action of God, it is overwhelming and it causes my level of trust to rise up. Because unity can't be faked. You can't fake unity. It's pretty obvious over time. That's why Proverbs 3, it says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He will direct you. He will guide you. As we are one with Christ, one with the body of Christ, his church, we gain trust. So we have peace, we have trust, and all of this results in confidence. Unity will make us more confident when we're walking in unity again with God and the body of Christ. When the disciples experienced all of this, there was this confidence that poured out of their lives. And often, surprisingly, many of the disciples, uh, when they would walk in this confidence, people were shocked and they were amazed that they they were walking in this. 
You know, James even, uh, and, and, and sometimes we lack this confidence in our lives because we're divided. We want to do the things, we, we know the things that we should do, but we struggle to do them because there's a lack of unity in our own heart. James, James 1 des, des, describes this as a divided person, one that lacks u- unity, and he uses the, word, uh, the, the words double-minded. James 1, 6, 8 says, For a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. He says, Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. When we are one with God and one with the body of Christ, the choice has been made. The power and the authority that Jesus has, he gives to us. And my heart is filled with peace. And I'm walking full in trust. With all of this in play, how can I not be confident walking with him? And of course, one of the other signs, and there are so many that we could talk about today, but there is a growth that Jesus talks about that accompanies this aspect of when we are one with God and one with the body of Christ. In John 17, 23, in his prayer, Jesus said, May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. See, in this prayer, Jesus is connecting unity with growth, with the body of Christ, with the kingdom of God expanding When the body of Christ, when the church is unified, the world around it, the community around, it takes notice. I mean, when you're covered with the peace that comes from unity and you're filled with the trust that comes from unity and that develops into this confidence, this is contagious because people are hungry for this. The church should be so unified that when people come in and they see it, they should be amazed. They should walk in and say, what is going on in this place? There's so much disunity and so much arguing in so many places. That's why the body of Christ, unified, unified under the Lord, is this, it causes the world to stand and to stare and to want to be a part of it. And, and we'll cause them to say, can I be a part of this? And of course, the answer to that is yes, you can be a part of it. We invite you to be a part of it. The body of Christ is never perfect because I'm, I, I'm a part of it. I'm a part of it. But, as, but we work together, unified with God, walking in unity with each other, humbly submitting ourselves. And there's, there's nothing like it. See, when we are one with God and one with each other, the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that fills us, that empowers us, that reminds us, that teaches us, they begin to pour forth. Galatians 5, and 23 lay out these fruits. It's, it's the fruit of love, the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace, uh, the truth of forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that we all need. And then it says that against these things, there is no law. It means that there's there's nothing preventing it. Nothing can stop this. This is why Jesus in his farewell prayer, he's emphasizing to them, he's praying over them, that you would be one, that you would walk in unity. This is so powerful that the Apostle Paul even prayed this over all the churches that he planted. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 This is Paul's prayer. He said, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then Paul says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of yourselves as better, thinking of others rather, as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Unity is powerful. It is essential. It is a mark of a follower of Christ. Again, it doesn't mean that we don't experience storms. It doesn't mean we don't hit hard times. It doesn't mean the waves don't rush in, but when we're unified, one with God, one with each other, We are standing firm on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And nothing can shake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So knowing all of this, knowing the value, knowing the purpose, and and knowing that we want it so bad in our lives, why do we struggle? Why do we struggle with unity? Why do we not seem to see it or at times not have it? Well, one of the reasons is unity has a cost. Everything of great value will have a cost in our lives. And it was the cost of discipleship following Christ. 
that caused so many to walk away sad from Jesus. And even today, as we talk about who Jesus is, there's a hunger for the love of God to experience it. But when it comes to the cost, that denying yourself, so many walk away sad. And unfortunately, some move from sadness to trying to silence and even removing the validity of Christ. See, Jesus' words to those who would not follow him were, deny yourself, throw away your nets, sell all that you have. This is the cost of discipleship. To be one in marriage, you have to leave your father and your mother. See, to be one with anything, this unity, it means that I need to give up everything. Jesus, he's not looking for a date. <laughs> he's, the Bible says that he's looking for his bride. That's the commitment. See, Jesus, he died for his bride. He fights for his bride. We must do the same. Anything less is not what Jesus is talking about. You'll never be happy in this life. You'll never have the contentment. You'll never have that peace that the Bible talked about that passes all understanding without this full surrender, becoming one with God and then one with the body of Christ, with his church. See, any church that does less than this will never be happy. See, our, our community, it needs to be one that's made of people that deny themselves and they follow Christ. That's why we gather every week. That's why we give every week, both of finances as well as our talents and giving. It's all unto the Lord for his glory, for his purpose to build his kingdom. That's why we serve every week. That's why the community shows up to see, is the church here? Is the body of Christ here? Are they loving each other? Are they serving one another? And the question that I would have for us is, are we here? Are we showing up to meet our community and to serve those around us? See, sometimes we struggle with unity because we're not showing up. We've not committed to be there and to step up and to stand up in those moments. See, if I want to be unified with my family, if I want to be, want to be the leader of my family that God's called me to be, I need to consistently and regularly show up, be there. It's that ministry of presence that I have with my family, willing to do whatever it takes to be faithful and to serve them. This is what a dad and a husband does. This is what a, what a mom does. This is what a mom does. See, and the same is true with Christ. I came across this quote as I was thinking about unity and just, pray, and just uh, praying through this. I came across this, this quote by Francis Chan. Francis Chan says, In the church, we divide easily because we live shallowly. We divide easily because we live shallowly. See, depth is tough. It takes some digging. It takes some planting. It takes some commitment to be there, to go deep. And it's costly. But where there is no depth, we are easily swayed. When we don't dig to go into the foundation, and an illustration that I'll often use with students when they're thinking about their life and, and the cost and the commitment it takes as they look forward to the path that God's called them, something I'll often say to them is, you know, the higher the building God wants to build in your life, the deeper the foundation he will build. The higher the building, the deeper the foundation. Don't shortchange the process that God has in your life. Commit to it, one with God, one with others, and allow that foundation to go deep. See, it's easy to leave places that we've never really lived. It's easy to let go of things that we've never really allowed ourselves to become a part of. Jesus is calling us to live deeper. And my prayer for us, Shoreline Community Church, and our families, that as we move forward, my hope is that we would walk in unity together. Unity with God and unity with each other. So before we head, head back and worship with the team today, here's a couple of reflection questions that I'd encourage you to ask yourself today, but also to take with you during the week and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And that first question is, where am I feeling divided today? Is there any part of my life that feels out of sorts, where it's, it doesn't seem to be quite there? Maybe you're lacking the peace that I talked about, or maybe you're lacking that confidence, or maybe trust is at an all-time low for you. One of the first places to look is that Francis Chan quote, where is my faith shallow? Are there places that I'm, I'm living in a shallow way? I've, I've not dug deeper. I've been hesitant for a variety of reasons. And the follow-up to that is, what do I need to change? What do I need to change? Moving forward requires change. What is the cost 
perhaps that I've been unwilling to pay. Areas of my life I've been unwilling to surrender or areas maybe it's been too painful. What is the cost that Christ is asking you to pay today? What is the net that the Lord is asking you to throw down? Where are the areas that God's asking you to, sh to step up, to show up, and to be a part of his plan? Amen? Amen. Let me just pray over you before we worship with the team today. Father, I thank you for all those that are watching today, listening and engaging. And Lord, this issue of unity is so important that you made it a part of your farewell prayer. It's so important that Paul prayed this over all his churches. So Lord, let that be in us. Show us areas of our life that we're not walking in unity today. Areas of us, of our lives that maybe are shallow. Areas where trust is difficult. Areas where uh, we're lacking confidence. Lord, do your work in, today, in us today. Holy Spirit, fill us. Let the fruits of your Spirit be alive in us as we are one with you and then one with others in the body of Christ in your name. Amen. Amen. Now let's join the worship team as we lift our voices and worship in unity together.
Oh, it's so good to be together. I love, even though I, I can't see you, I know you're all there. And I love going in and seeing all of the comments and the ways that you're engaging. So thank you for joining some worship. This is part of us being together, unified in Christ. One thing I, I just want to mention, I hope you saw that Convoy of Hope one day video. This is an offering again that we're going to be taking on Palm Sunday where we're encouraging everyone to pray about giving one day's wage to feed those that are hungry in the world to pray about it. Pray and seek the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me do in this? And then on Palm Sunday, we're all going to be bringing our offering to the Lord so that the world would receive uh, the bread in order to see the bread of life through this. This is true religion, when we feed those who are hungry, when we reach out to those that are in need. So I encourage you to do that. Another thing is that next week we begin a new series. Uh, the Lenten season begins as we work our 40 days until, uh, until Easter. So I'm very excited about it. This year we're going to be doing a series called Living a Cross-Shaped Life. We're going to be talking about what it means to deny ourselves and about how Jesus uh, experienced all the things that we often struggle to pick up, the humiliation, the misunderstandings. But as we deny ourselves and follow Him, we find that cross-shaped life to the full that Jesus talked about. So, hope you can join us. Hope you'll be here. As always, this is our benediction. Let's say this together as we say goodbye today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious towards you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Now go and live for Jesus. We love you all so very much. God bless.